The Bible has this amazing passage in 2 Corinthians 4, and if you would take a moment and uh, turn there, and if you don't have a Bible, no worries, um, 2 Corinthians 4 is where we're going to jump in in just a second, but I want to just kind of throw something on your radar that maybe, just maybe, it's possible that what you see every day is not everything that's there. Could, could it be that you could look at something and have looked at it a thousand times, but that that maybe, just maybe, what's really there and what you see that's there are two different things? Is that possible? You're like, no, can't fool me, right? Okay, well, here's a, just a cheesy example jumping in. Uh, take the FedEx logo. Uh, you've seen it probably a billion times in your life, right? It's just always on airplanes, always on trucks going by. It's an amazing story how it was done because there were 200 different designs that were submitted when this was chosen as the new logo because the old logo was Federal Express, yeah, some of you are, are old enough to remember those days, but then the customer base began speaking about co- the company and using the word FedEx, and it was kind of irritating to the company at first, like, hey, that's actually not our name, uh, so, but then they realized people loved the word so much, they would even UPS stuff and say FedEx. I'm going to FedEx you that, right? It just means I'm going to get it to there quickly, and so they decided to accommodate the customer's way of speaking about it. So by the way, there's power in what you speak. There's power in the words that come out of your mouth that can change things, right? Billion dollar company, it changed because of how people talk about it. How do you talk about your life? How do you talk about your, how do you talk about your relationship? How do you talk about your day? How do you talk about this service? You'll get out of it exactly what you put into it. How we speak matters. Okay, so this logo gets brought in along with five others. There was 200 design, only five got brought to the company. That means 195 of them weren't good enough. Were they failures? No, they were just stepping stones on the way to greatness. So what in your life are you giving up on because it's not working? You just need to work a little harder. You just need to go back to the drawing board a few more times. That song, you just need, maybe it's there. You just need to keep going, right? Let it go from Frozen. How many of y'all parents hate that song, right? <laughs> There was like 17 rejections before they got onto that song. They weren't rejections. It was just the opportunity to produce the thing that God had inside of you. Just keep chipping away. Just keep. So this one gets turned in. Keep it up for a moment, please. Uh, The logo um, gets turned in with five others. Fred Smith, CEO of FedEx. He walks up to all five of them mocked up on on the drawing room board. He walked up and said, I want that one. That's our new logo right there. That's the logo for FedEx. I like that one. And they said, why? There's others that are better. He said, I like the one with the arrow in it. His team was confused. They didn't get it. And he got up and pointed to between the E and the X, where there's a perfectly formed, between the E and the X, between the E and the, between the, how many of you still can't see it? You're confused. There's always one. Between the E and the X, there is a perfectly formed arrow. Now, listen, you're probably thinking I tricked you and I put that arrow, that arrow has been there every single time you've ever seen that logo. Now, honesty in God's house, if you tell a lie, you're going straight to hell. How many of you have never noticed the arrow before in your life? Now, let's, I have to first of all apologize because I've screwed you forever because you will never not see that arrow. I don't even see the logo anymore. I just see an arrow going by. Arrow. Error. You'll probably get in a car wreck in next month, like trying to tell your co- co-pilot about it. They're like, drive. You're like, arrow. <laughs> but every time you've ever seen that logo, it's been there, the arrow just staring at you, just hiding in plain sight. Wow. And that, my friends, enough with the logo. I'm probably going to get sued anyway for showing it. I don't got permission to show that to you. <laughs> don't put that on the podcast, Voo Church. Okay, listen. It's possible that what you're seeing in your life and what you think you see are two different things. And if you'll jump in with me at 2 Corinthians 4, Paul tells us that we need to be very carefully um, challenge what we see versus what's actually there. He's describing how he goes through hardship. He's describing how he goes through difficulty but doesn't give up. Because Paul was the kind of a guy who no matter how much of a beating he took, and he took considerable amount of beatings, I mean, every day, Paul would just like, wake up, get beat up. Wake up, get rocked, with, 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 get stoned with rocks. Not weed, guys, <laughs> but he would get stoned repeatedly uh, with, with, with rocks being thrown at him. One time he got, he got beaten until he was dead. 
but then would, would just get up and keep preaching again. And uh, he, he, one time he was preaching a sermon. People tried to assassinate him. They had to let him out of the city wall in a basket. Uh, he got shipwrecked. And then he tried to build a fire to warm the other prisoners who were on the beach. And, and while building a fire to warm prisoners, get this, a viper jumps out of the fire and bites him. <laughs> and just hangs there from his arm. No one did anything. No one did anything. And you know what Paul did? He shook the viper into the fire that it came from. I got a couple thoughts. They're not in my sermon, but every time you try and do something that will light up the night, the enemy will bring an intense fight. And the secret is to shake the snake into the same fire that it came from. So you get criticism for doing something great for God. So you get pushback. So you get, so you get rumors told about you because of something you're doing. They, but let me tell you something. The people who have given up on their dreams will always hate on you for walking out yours. And, and so what you got to do is you just got to learn to shake it off into the same. Listen, listen. Shake it off and then burn 10 times fi- higher. Burn 10 times hotter. Don't let it stop you. All right. So, so that was the kind of stuff Paul would go through. But, but people in his life were like, dude, how, how do you even keep going? How do you not give up? And Paul answers their question here in 2 Corinthians 4. Look at verse 16 on the screen. It says, that is why we never give up. You're like, why? Here we go. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Now, if you were interrupting, if you were the sort to interrupt, which I would never do that, I would interrupt Paul right here and say, what are you even talking about? Your troubles are small. They're huge. The stuff you go through, haven't you been lied about? Haven't you been abandoned? Haven't you had people who said they were always going to be there leave? Haven't you been stoned to death? Haven't you been whipped? Haven't you been flogged? Paul, your trials are huge, and they last all the time. And Paul would say, no, they're small, and they won't last very long. And that's because he wasn't staring at what he was going through. He was seeing something that the human eye couldn't see, something that only God could see. That is what the trials are producing. And why were the trials deemed uh, not lasting very long when they took up his entire life? Because Paul didn't define his entire life as just the years that he lived on this earth. Oh, that? 70 years if you don't get hit by a bus? 80 years, if something doesn't go tragically wrong, cutting you down in the prime of your life, which happens to us all the time, Paul saw that as just part of the story. Paul happened to believe something crazy, that if you believe in Jesus Christ, that when you die, you will live, and your life goes on forever, and a whole lot longer than however you get on this earth, even if you get 80. He happened to believe that 10,000 years after dying, when he's standing in heaven singing God's praise, he will have more days to sing God's praise than when he first begun. His life was hidden with Christ and God, and he knew that when Christ appeared, that he would appear with him in glory and get a brand new resurrection body, just like Jesus got when he rose up out of that grave. And so he's looking at 10,000 years that he has to look forward to. Someone said we shouldn't call what happens after we die the afterlife, that we should call what happens right now during life the pre-life, because our real life begins one minute after we die. Doesn't make what happens on this earth matter less. It, it makes it matter even more, actually. But, but Paul would laugh. You're like, Paul, your trials are huge and they last forever. He's like, oh, oh, that? 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 It's like the naughty scene in Fight Club. It's just a second. Like life here, seven years here, when you compare it to 10,000, God, it'll turn huge, 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 huge tornadoes of problems into small potatoes. That's what it'll do for you when you have this kind of right perspective. So, so he says, they don't last forever. They, that's just a tiny little thing, right? Paquito, right? But notice this. <laughs> but they produce yet, verse 17, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. If you're in Christ, your trial's not going to last forever, but what the trial does inside of you, that you'll get to keep forever. <laughs> so the, the, the beautiful diamond that the, the, the pressure of this life is creating of the, out of the coal of your situation, you won't keep the trial forever, but you'll keep the glory that God produces inside of you through your trial. So your hardship, that's just an agent of change. 
But after you get to heaven, the gates there are going to strip you of all the agents of change, and you only get to keep the change that it produced, and that you'll get to keep forever. So Paul says, because of that, verse 18, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze. I love that. We choose where we look. We, we get to pick what we, we stare at. We choose to look, to fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Paul says, I choose to focus on the arrow inside the logo. For the things we see now will soon be gone. If all you look at is dollars and cents and logos and square footage and followers and likes, your gaze is broken. You got to fix what you're staring at by fixing it on things that cannot be seen and counted and purchased and stolen and sold. You got to hide your treasure in a place where moth and rust. But the th we're just reading the Bible here, guys. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Eugene Peterson said once, reality is mostly made up of what you cannot see. What we touch feels so real. It's tactile. I can touch it. I can buy it. I can wear it. I can, I can use it. I can drive it. That feels so real. But the, it's the immaterial that currently now is a dimension in which we cannot operate in. Only God does. Uh, that is what is actually real. That is what is actually concrete. That is actually what is going to last forever. And my prayer is that God would help us to understand that and to live out of that. Would you, would you join me praying? Father, we ask for you to fill us with your spirit. We ask for a supernatural thing to occur that would take place even now as we consider what we just read. Because it is, is truly so simple and yet so complex. It is truly so, so, so formative and, 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 and so life-changing. If we would just grasp what we just read there, everything would be different. So I pray for these precious people. I pray for those in the additional seating. I thank you for what you've done here, and thank you for the way it's just you getting started. And we believe that, that what we're about to read and experience and, 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 and learn to walk out, it, it could change everything for us. It could change everything for South Florida. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about how to see your life through the eyes of a lion, how to see life through the eyes of a lion. It's a metaphor that stands for looking at life through a telescope of faith, looking at life through the right lens. You realize the lens that you use, it, it, can, it, it can mean the difference between seeing and not seeing. I'm wearing contact lenses right now. Without, without them, I wouldn't be able to see any of you. But uh, the lens that we, we choose to use, it, it, it could make a big difference if it's the wrong lens. If I put your contact lens in, it, I would, it's not just having a lens, it's having the right lens. On April 24th, 1990, the United States Space Agency, NASA, they sent their, at the time, largest, most powerful, most versatile space telescope into orbit that, that had ever been conceived by man. The, the vision was to have the eyes in the sky that would help us to see what telescopes on Earth, no matter how powerful they are, would never be able to see. You see, any telescope on our planet to see the heavens has to look through the Earth's atmosphere that surrounds us like a blanket. Scientists say that looking through the atmosphere effectively is like looking through a piece of dirty stained glass. You, if you looked through dirty stained glass, you wouldn't see the outside world. You would see it through, colored by, distorted by, changed by the lens. That's what the atmosphere does for us. So, uh, for example, that, that song that moms around the world sing to their babies at night, Twinkle, how does that go? I can't ever remember. Twinkle, little stuff. Stop it. It's lies. Lies. I don't want to hear any of that. The stars do not twinkle. They are steady. They are constant. They are unchanging. They only appear to twinkle because of shifting pockets of gas within the Earth's atmosphere. So again, what you're seeing and what's there, two completely different things. So Hubble would fly around the planet at a distance of 366 miles above our Earth, our Earth and it would fly around the planet once every 96 minutes. So every time a Marvel movie ends, it's made a pass around, <laughs> around our planet. But it's sitting above the atmosphere at, uh, at, uh, in, in what's called low Earth orbit. So it could see the heavens unobstructed and report back to us what it's seeing, and we could have an accurate understanding of, of, of the solar system and the galaxy and the, the wonders of the heavens. 
And uh, believe it or not, the original plan called for Hubble taking pictures on some sort of film cartridge and then jettisoning the can into the ocean somewhere, and then we'd have to just go find it. Can you imagine how frustrating that job would be? Like, I'm just trying to find this can of film, right? But that would only be half the, half the, the way to victory because it was 1990, so they'd still have to find a Walgreens to develop the pictures, guys. <laughs> That's, that was a struggle. Remember that? How different it was? I'm, I have an 11-year-old daughter. And I was trying to tell you the other day about how I had to have more faith as a child. You take a picture, you don't know for a week what, whether you got anything good. Yeah. I probably somewhere still have a can of film ready for me to pick. I might have even checked the doubles box, right? It's just, it's just a bit blurry, blurry. My finger was in front of the shutter. Dang it, right? They see a picture right away, right away. And we keep them all, you right? Like, why? Because we want our phones to run slow. That's why we... No, so, so here, here's the thing. So they figured out... These are the jokes, people. They figured out how how Hubble was going to be able to take pictures and in real time beam them back to us here on Earth. They were excited about that. So they shoot this thing up into the air. It costs $1.5 billion. Discovery takes it out there, sets it free. It's just floating around. It's taking pictures. And when they loaded up the initial images from Hubble, they were horrified to discover, look at this, that the pictures were all blurry, completely and totally useless. They went back to the math, and they figured out they had made a mistake when they made Hubble's lens. Guys, Hubble needed glasses. <laughs> Not a good look for a supersonic space telescope. Space telescope. You know, it's like, like, I'm really good at flying around. Yeah, Hubble, you had one job. Uh, I need you to see really far. That's really all we built you for, pal. $1.5 billion. And uh, so, so they didn't know what to do because Hubble had a lens issue. The primary optical component was the wrong depth, and so it caused Hubble to be nearsighted. Space Shuttle Endeavor brought the solution. They took an enormous contact lens to outer space. This is honestly the, the solution. They, they built an enormous contact lens with the same error backwards, inverted. And they thought if we put it on a front, it could cancel it out. And that's exactly what happened. And so once this new lens was in place, they fired it up once again. And it, well, the proof is in the... Thanks, Hubble. Come on, let's just give God some praise because he made that. And he built you with as much passion, detail, and excellence. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. We speak that over little baby Wilkerson right now. God has been dreaming of how he would use him since the beginning of the world. Stephen Covey once said, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And that means we could see something every day of our lives but not have a clue what we're looking at. When Hubble was sending blurry pictures to Walgreens. It wasn't the universe's fault. It wasn't the Aurora Borealis's fault. It wasn't the Milky Way galaxy's fault. Y'all, Hubble had a lens problem. So here's my question. What lens do you choose to use to view pain that you go through? When you go through something hard, like Paul, when you go through something horrible, when you go through something scary, what is your go-to lens to look at it through? How do you interpret what you're facing? My premise, and the reason I, I wrote a book called Through the Eyes of a Lion, is that we need to choose to use the lens called faith in order to make sense of what we see. Lions have spectacular vision. They can see six times better than us. So whereas in the back row, I can't tell, is that Bill, is that Sue, is that Johnny? A lion would say, I know exactly what that is. That's lunch right there, right? <laughs> Lions, lions see, look at this picture of a lion. Lions see so well through the eyes of a lion. They see so well for a number of reasons. My favorite is the fact that they have a white stripe under each eye. And God put that there for the exact opposite reason an athlete wears black under their eye. Where in the black, we see the ability for the sun to not come into the eye as much. Lions hunt at night where there's very faint light, but God put the white there so all light that's available will come straight into their eyes. Come on, heaven, open up the eyes of our soul. Would you dilate the pupils of our heart? Would you give us the wisdom of spiritual revelation? Would the eyes of our understanding be enlightened? Would all the light that's there hiding in plain sight come straight into our eyes? That through the, the faith that you've chosen to give, give to us, would, would it enable us to, to face the impossible? Uh, but, but to rise up in a supernatural way in this life. Um, we need this. We needed this, and we learned this the hard way as a family um, because of what we faced that we never expected in 2012. Um, we planted a church uh, 10 and a half years ago, 
And you heard a little bit about that. And, and as the campuses began to grow, church began to grow, our family began to grow. And our second born daughter was a little girl named Linya. Uh, Linya, at the age of five, had an asthma attack five days before Christmas. We're wrapping up Christmas presents, so excited about the happiest time of the year. And all of a sudden, Linya began to be short of breath. Now, I've had asthma since the third grade. Uh, I was having like 19 asthma attacks today with, working out with your pastor. Um, <laughs> Because it's activity-induced, right? Uh, and and uh, I should have just pulled my inhaler out and ran away. They, they, no one's going to judge you, right? <laughs> but I didn't. Um, and uh, anybody else have asthma here at, at, in God's house? Okay. Experienced that? Now, this is your moment. Don't raise it up halfway. It's like, when else do you be like, yeah, asthmatic and proud, right? <laughs> Let's get together after service and puff our albuterol, guys. <laughs> Why would you say that? It's highly inappropriate. Probably illegal. But hey, we have prescriptions. We're fine. So... I, normally, you get, you get wheezy, you take a puff, and you feel better. That's how it's always been for me. It's how it's been for my oldest daughter, Olivia, and that's how it was for Linya. But five days before Christmas, this asthma attack, the medicine didn't change a bit. And instead of uh, breathing better after she took it, she began to breathe worse. And soon she stopped breathing altogether. Now, all of a sudden, we're in the midst of an emergency that we didn't see coming. I put her on the kitchen counter. We began to call 911 and frantically pray as I began to do CPR. But long story short, and traumatic made horribly, horribly oversimplified, my daughter died in my arms five days before Christmas as we called on Jesus who made the sun stand still to stop the sun in the sky and it set in front of us. As we trusted Christ who rose from the dead on the third day and caused Jairus' daughter to breathe again, who one time would, would, Elijah would put his mouth in his face and his hands over a, a child and pray for life to come back and it, it would happen. Jesus, who, who, who again and again gave miracles out and, and did the impossible. And as we called with all the faith we could muster for God to do the impossible, and he chose to say yes to our prayers, but to answer it in a very different way. We asked for more time with her. We asked for her life to be saved here on earth. And what he chose to do instead was to give her ultimate life, eternal life, forever life, as Jesus sent angels to pick up her soul and to bring her to heaven, to bring her to paradise, to be with him where she is today, leaving us here on a cold planet that we hated a bit more because of the fact that our daughter was no longer on it. We believe that that moment for her was, was when eternal life began, was when true joy, like, like no one could ever fathom, began to play out around her. She, she, she was transported to a place of, of perpetual summer where, where there's no shadow and no need to say goodbye. But we were left here to pick out caskets and to pick a funeral home and to choose uh, where the service would be that would take place the day after Christmas and to rummage through her things and, and make sense of what to do in the horrible aftermath of death. Things that we never thought possible would devastate us seeing her bicycle with a pink ha helmet hanging from the handlebars and the white walled tires it just caused you to double over in pain. Now, I have hope, but here's what I discovered the hard way. Hurting with hope still hurts. Yeah. And God doesn't begrudge you if you're here today and you're mad. God doesn't begrudge you if you're here today and you're full of grief and you don't understand and you're angry and you're confused. I'm telling you, it can be the picture of faith to be horrified and angry and mad and not understand, but in your rage still worship God and in your rage still say you give and you take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm telling you, I felt like a caged tiger. I wanted to tear all the equipment off the walls in the emergency room when that doctor came in and said, sorry, there's nothing more I can do. We're going to turn the machines off. Would you like to be there to say goodbye? I wanted to tear everything off the hospital. I felt, I felt so much anger and so much rage, but I still felt love and I still felt worship for my God who sent his son to the cross in order for us to have life. He never wanted us to experience death in the first place. It wasn't his plan. It's not his plan today, but his plan is to send Jesus to bring salvation in the midst of a world that long lay in sin and error pining. And he came to raise the sons of earth. He came to give them second birth. I can't be mad at the God who now holds my daughter. I can't be mad at the God who saved my soul and one day will reunite me with her. So, so there's, there's, there's a tension in the midst of it. There's an anger in it. And when I feel angry at what has happened to me, I feel God saying, I'm angry too, and I'm going to do something about it. And I read the book of Revelation, and I see his plan to destroy the enemy. I see his plan to destroy death itself. I see his plan to give us a new heaven and a new earth where there will be righteousness forever. And so in the midst of my pain, 
I lean into God's anger. I don't run from my anger. I run to him in the midst of his anger as he says, I'm mad too. I'm angry too. I think about some of the unnecessary details of the resurrection. I think of some of the absolutely ridiculous things like the fact that he has promised. Read it sometime. It's amazing. The Bible is so good. He has promised to come back with the sound of a trumpet, with a shout and the roar of an angel like a lion. And he's going to give the, give the word and every single Christian who has ever lived, he will raise their physical bodies from the grave. He will steal them from the jaw of death itself, and he will transform them into a glorified body that we will get to live in forever with Jesus who lives in his glorified body. Now, here's the thing. If I am Peter hearing God explain this, I'm going to go, wait, what? What? Like, I'm I'm Peter now. I'm in heaven. I've been in heaven since what? 35 AD, 60 AD. We'd have to ask Pastor Gary Clark how long Peter's been in heaven. But he's been in heaven for like just shy of 2,000 years. And whenever it happens, it could happen today. And may Jesus come quickly. Come on, Maranatha, may he come quickly, right? So, so when he does, when he comes, and that's why we got such urgency. That's why you need to have five more campuses. That's why you got to preach the gospel some more. Christ could come back at any moment. We don't have the luxury of sitting around playing it cool. We got to run into the night because I'm telling you, there is a day coming when you can't preach the gospel. You try and get to heaven and tell somebody about Jesus, they'll say, yeah, he's right over there. But right now, they don't know about him. Right now, we got to tell them about him. We got to go. We got to preach. We got to reach. We got to. So I'm Peter. I'm just talking to you, and I'm in heaven. And Jesus says, Peter, we got to go. The Father just told me, because up until that moment, he didn't even know. Jesus said, the Father only knows. The angels don't know. I don't even know. He separated himself from that information while he was in earth. So who would actually feel like we feel? He removed himself from the ability to understand all God's plan. So as Jesus functioned, he functioned like us. He had to trust, Jesus. He had to trust the Father every, every moment. And, and so now in heaven, Peter, Jesus is like, get on your white horse. Let's go. Let's go. It's time to go. And Peter's like, what's the deal? Uh, And Jesus says, I'm going to go get you your body back. Now, Peter, for 2,000 years, has been living in some sort of body. We know that heaven is like a city. We know it's a place. We know know it's it's not just an ethereal floating around Casper the ghosting it up, y'all. That's not it. When you think of heaven, you should think of riding a horse down the beach, tropical wind whipping through your hair, having a pina colada. Jesus said it's paradise, right? Don't be Casper the ghosting it. The devil came up with the boring heaven, so we'd be more excited about hell. I'm telling you, heaven is real life. It's more life. It's true life. There's art. There's beauty. There's dancing. There's poetry. It's a city. Heaven's a place like Pittsburgh, but better. So, so Peter says, you're going to go get my body? Worship team, come on out here. You're going to go get my body? And Jesus says, yeah. And he says, well, I've been living in something since I died. I got hung upside down on a cross upside down. I didn't know. I woke up here. This body seems pretty good. I haven't gotten sick. I've never had a bad day. I've never had a single headache. This body's fine. You realize God's going to give us some form to dwell in, right? And so Peter's in heaven going, this, this version's fantastic. What, 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 what in the world do you need that, that one for? That one was messed up. That one, you know, the foot has an issue. It always found its way to my mouth. That foot of that body... <laughs> And you're like, hold on, pause. It's been 2,000 years. That thing has been reduced ash to ash, dust to dust. And God would say, I know where every single molecule of dust is, and I made you out of dust in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to remake you out of dust. All I need is one little dot of Peter. I'll grab that and fashion a brand new body. And Peter would say, but honestly, I mean, it's great. that I love that you're taking it so seriously, but this one's just fine. God the Father would say to Peter, and God the Father would say to me, and I understand it as a father. Oh, no. We're going to go get that one back because something precious was taken and I'm going to make all things new. I love the resurrection because it's so unnecessary. It just shows there's something vindictive in the heart of God who hates that something's been taken from me. So I just came to Vu Church to tell you if something horrible has happened to you, if something dark has happened to you, then don't run from God. He's the one who has a plan to do something about it. Run to him in your pain. Run to him in your anger. Run to him in your rage. Run toward the roar. And may heaven help us to look at our life through the eyes of a lion with the kind of perspective that would see in the midst of it what you can't see with the naked eye. When my daughter took her last breath and we ended up in our living room at two in the morning, hurting and confused, the phone rang. And honestly, I thought it was going to be a call from the hospital saying, she sat up, she's good, your prayers have been heard, just delayed. 
That's what I thought. I grabbed the phone and it was indeed the hospital, but they were saying to me words no father wants to hear. They said, you know, we're supposed to ask you about organ donation. Have you thought about your daughter's heart valves? Have you thought about, and basically all I heard was, can we cut into your baby girl? We prayed about it and we made the decision. She doesn't need those valves right now, but if it could save someone else's life and give them more time to hear about Jesus, God, God and Linya both would have us to say yes. So we said yes, we made that decision. And they called us back a couple weeks later. We got a letter in the mail eventually. And we've written out to him and reached out to him. We haven't gotten to be in touch with him yet, but the day's coming. I'm believing for it. Let me show you my little girl. This is Lenya, who we're, we can't wait to be reunited with again one day. Let me tell you what they told us. They told us we took her corneas. And with her two corneas, the cornea is the outermost lens of the eye. With the lenses of her eye, they were able to give sight to two blind people. And they today see life through the eyes of a lion. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a God who's so good, he'll even bring good out of bad. He's so good, he'll even bless you in places where you never should have gone. So come on, right now, all across the church, let's trust God with our pain, let's trust God with our problems, and let's just say for a second, your name, your name, It has no rival. Come on, let's sing it out. It has no equal. Let's lift up Jesus in this place. Come on, sing it all across the church.